Uh, after one of the meetings at Potsdam, around the big table, our whatever was stolen and informed him that we had found the most powerful, discovered the most po powerful explosive which we expected to use in the war, and we thought probably it would end it. He smiled and thanked me, but I don't think he understood what I was talking about. And could you redo that one so that we don't have to say getting back to Potsdam just in case there is no antecedent? Mr. President, I remember that you told Stalin at Potsdam that we had the atomic bomb. Did he seem to be impressed at that time? After one of the regular meetings, I went over and told him that we had discovered a powerful explosive which we expected to use in the Japanese war, and I hoped it would end it. He smiled at me, but he didn't seem to understand exactly what I was talking about, and I turned around and left it. Uh, when the bomb was finally dropped, over Hiroshima, was it done on a miscalculation of Japanese military power? Well, when the bomb was dropped, the war was near to ending anyway. Was this the result of a miscalculation of the Japanese potential? Was our intelligence faulty in this area? I don't think so. The best information we had was that it would cost us uh, half a million casualties and probably 250,000 of our young men to be killed and as many Japanese. And uh, the Japanese had been offered a chance to surrender previous to that time. They wouldn't accept it. So we had to follow through as best we could. We worked on the best intelligence we could possibly get. Any hindsight, though, will show you that it was uh, maybe a different. That's always the case. Yes. Uh, at Potsdam, uh, Stalin told you During the Potsdam Conference, you recommended the internationalization of a number of waterways. Suez, the Bosphorus, um, all of the others. I can answer. The Panama Canal, too. That was rather prophetic, wasn't it? The uh, proposition was made to make uh, international free waterways, except for the riparian rights of the people who were affected of the Kiel Canal, the Rhine Danube Canal, the Black Sea Straits, the Suez Canal, the Straits of Gibraltar, and the Panama Canal to be free waterways for merchant ships, but not for warships. And uh, it was presented by me and on three different occasions that they, they got nowhere. Yes. Both Churchill and Stalin were against it. It's your feeling that national sovereignty will erode if there is not more unity on a global scale? Is it your feeling, Mr. President, that, that gradually national sovereignty will erode and there will come about a greater unity between the nations? I don't like the word erode. I think national sovereignty will always exist. But there will come a time when there will be a broader view of the whole situation, just as there was between the 13 colonies in the organization of the United States. And then we'll have a United Nations organization that will work to keep the peace in the world. And that's its objective. Uh, speaking about the U.N. Charter, uh, you were in favor of the veto power, weren't you? Uh, speaking of the United Nations, you were in favor of the veto power when the document was drawn, weren't you? All of us were in favor of the veto power, but we had no idea that it would be abused as the Russians have abused it. It we thought was for our protection as well as everybody else's. Is it your feeling that the General Assembly should now have more power? Is it your feeling now, Mr. President, that Perhaps it would have been wiser to give the General Assembly more power in relation to the Security Council? I really think so, because the uh, uh, General Assembly comes more merely being a representative organization in the, the Council. Uh, when you announced the Point Four program back in 1948, right. uh, Mr. President, when you announced the Point Four program, you did it in uh, what seemed to be an almost casual fashion. Did you think it would grow and expand to the point it did? I hoped it would, but I was not sure that it would be accepted for what it is. It's been a very successful program, and it was made a successful program in its beginning by Dr. Bennett of Oklahoma, who was the head of Oklahoma A&M. Uh, looking back, would you think that the Marshall Plan was the single most important step in stopping the spread of communism? In hindsight, Mr. President, would you consider the Marshall Plan as the major step in stopping the spread of communism in Western Europe? It made one of the greatest contributions, but it took all these things. The Greek and Turkish program, the Berlin Airlift, the operation in Korea to make it 
make the Soviets understand just exactly what we meant, that the economic recovery of the free nations was one of the most essential things to bring about the, the present situation in the world, and we hope for peace. And it was very bad, I and mean, I think you might say who he was, and who was impressed really ran with the book. And it was Ernest Bevan, the British Foreign Secretary, who was impressed with the book, and seeing the opportunity and ran with it, wasn't it? Yes, he was very much impressed, and he saw the uh, opportunity, because England was in trouble, very bad trouble, and so was France. They accepted the situation, and that helped to make it a very successful program. Uh, how long uh, did you consider the Truman Doctrine? How long did you consider the Truman Doctrine before you announced it? Well, uh, it had been, uh, I don't like to call it the Truman Doctrine. It was part of the foreign policy of the United States to save Greece and Turkey from communism. It had been studied, and when we found that the British had to move out of Greece, we had to act, and that's what brought it about. It didn't take very long to make a decision on it. It had to be done. Uh, speaking of the that position as commander-in-chief. He can make, make and break generals whenever he feels like it. He ought to be uh, a man who will act unfortunately on the subject, but there comes a time when he has to assert his authority as commander-in-chief, and that is one of them. Uh, how did you decide to make that decision on the process? And whom did you consult? How did you decide to remove General MacArthur and whom did you consult? Me, that again, right. How did the Secretary of Defense, who happened to be General Marshall, and the Secretary of State, who was Dean Atchison, and the Chief of Staff, who was General... Uh, uh, Lord, uh, uh, speaking of Johnson's difficulties with his cabinet, which is the way that ended up, you had some difficulties with your own cabinet, didn't you? Uh, speaking of Johnson's difficulties with his cabinet, uh, you had some difficulties with yours occasionally, didn't you? Yes, uh, that always happens in every uh, uh, presidential term. There uh, are some difficulties with the cabinet. Compared with uh, Lincoln's and Andrew Johnson's difficulties, mine were minor ones because I took care of them without as much trouble as they had. Well, it was not a proper plan, and it went out the window, uh, as such plans usually do, when they're not uh, on the right track. Uh, is the important thing what the man brings to the presidency, or what? Mm -hmm. Mr. President, is the important thing what the man brings to the presidency, or what the presidency does to the man? It's a matter of both, but I think what the, president, the presidency does to the man is the more important. He's got the proper uh, background and is an honorable man. Uh, the presidency will develop him into a position where he'll do the job that is ought to be done. Uh, have you ever tried to analyze what the presidency has done to you? Mr. President, have you ever tried to analyze what the presidency did to you? Well, that's a hard thing to do. It takes an un, uh, unbiased observer to come to a conclusion like that. No man can figure out what anything does to him, but the presidency undoubtedly did do things to me in a manner that uh, I've had some difficulty in recovering. Uh, in retrospect, did your attitude change much after the 1948 election? In retrospect, did your attitude toward the presidency change very much after the 1948 election? No, it did not. The only uh, thing that the 1948 election did, it made me feel that the people were behind me in what I was trying to do, and it gave me more confidence in carrying through on the decisions which I had to make. Uh, do you have a feeling that our system of government makes it difficult for the Secretary of State to negotiate a board? Do you have the feeling that our system of government makes it unusually difficult for our Secretary of State to negotiate with foreign countries? No, I do not, for the simple reason that the Secretary of State and the President of the United States are should be and always are in complete agreement on policy. And the Secretary of State, if he's a wise man, will negotiate on that basis and keep the President informed directly of what's taking place all the time. Uh, was this the difficulty of the relationship between Secretary Burns and yourself? Was this the basis of the difficulty between uh, yourself and Secretary of State Burns? Yes, it was. Uh, Secretary Burns didn't keep me informed on what he was doing in Moscow. And so... The result was that Secretary Burns resigned from the cabinet in the long run. He had the feeling that he was running the shop. Um, then, 
He had the feeling that he was the one who was running the shop. Undoubtedly, that is the case, and that also was the case with Seward when he first went into Lincoln's cabinet. But Seward learned his lesson and became one of the great secretary of state, uh, secretaries of state, but uh, Jim Burns didn't learn it. Uh, Mr. President, you've been quoted as saying that uh, you don't like yes-men. Mr. President, you have been quoted several times as saying that you do not like yes-men around you. I do not. I want them that they were frank with me and tell me what they think and who analyzed the things that I, that I was trying to do in an unbiased and unprejudiced manner. And then after the decision's made, I want those men to go along with me, and that what makes it, that's what makes a president successful and makes a good cabinet. Uh, what, Mr. President, do you consider to have been your biggest mistake? Mr. President, uh, what do you consider to have been your greatest mistake? That's a hard one to answer. A great many people would say that everything I did was a mistake. But I don't think that's the case. Uh, uh, fundamentally, uh, I'm eager to, uh, just enough to think that most of the decisions that I made, and I can't think of one that went radically wrong, were correct. What about the steel strike? Um, what about the steel strike? The steel strike was uh, in the interest of the emergency, which then was, uh, prevailed with Korea. It was necessary for me to take the action I did, and I think it was right, and I think eventually the minority opinion of the Supreme Court will become the law of the land. It will have to, uh, according to precedent. I don't know what is the matter with that court when they made that decision. Uh, do you feel that your advocacy of civil rights had influence on the segregation decision? Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel that your long advocacy of civil rights was perhaps a prelude to the Supreme Court's decision on segregation? I think it had uh, some effect on that decision. Uh, the Supreme Court, you find out, is very uh, able to understand public opinion generally, and they usually make the decisions on the basis that they think is uh, in the public interest because uh, they're partly a, a uh, legislative body in the long run. At least they try to legislate sometimes when the Congress will let them. But uh, you'll find that the decisions, main decisions of the Supreme Court, are in the public interest and are made on the basis of public opinion. I think that's the case in this uh, decision to which we are referring. Because uh, the programs of President Roosevelt and myself have been to implement the Constitution of the United States as it's written. Uh, this sounds like a repeat, and it is. Uh, do you feel your decision in the steel strike and seizing the mills was correct? Mr. President, uh, do you still feel that your decision to seize the steel mills was correct? Yes, I do. What about Thailand? Um, what about Thailand oil, offshore oil? Thailand's oil uh, is a misnomer. It's offshore oil. Thailand's is that land that's exposed when the tide goes up and down. The states, uh, that's their territory, the low tide. The uh, federal government is the only government that can enforce and police the seas. No state's able to do it. Therefore, from low tide to the continental shelf, I always consider to be the property of the whole United States and not any one state. And I still think that. I wrote two veto messages on it, which covers the thing very thoroughly, and there are two Supreme Court decisions on it, which cover it in the same manner. Uh, how long will it take for it, in your opinion, for implementation of a Supreme Court decision on segregation? Mr. President, in your opinion, how long will it take to implement the Supreme Court's decision on segregation? Eventually, those wise men will prevail, and non-segregation in education and opportunity and economy will work out to the welfare and benefit of this country and to the whole world. You said in 1948 you were prepared to risk your career on the matter of civil rights. You still feel Mr. President, in 1948, you risked defeat and split your own party on the matter of civil rights. Why? I thought it was right, and I still think it was right, and the people thought it was right. And uh, I had a commission that, had, that uh, it put out one of the finest reports on the subject. Uh, its subject is to implement these rights. Then you think the voter is unpredictable? Then you, then you think the voter is unpredictable? He's only unpredictable in this way. If he knows the facts and they're properly explained to him, 
He's not unpredictable. But if the demagogues get charge of things, he is then unpredictable. I really think that no man understands what he's going to do exactly until he goes into the polls. That's the reason I don't bring him posters. <laughs> In 1948, you risked defeat, split your own party on the subject of civil rights. Why? Because I thought it was right, and I still think it was right, and the people thought it was right. And uh, I don't think this country can have one policy at home and another policy abroad and expect to be the leaders of the free world. Mr. President, don't try to answer these. These are just for heads. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. I'll be ah. Why? Why? Why would this why I, was this, Mr. President? Because I thought it was right. Again. Why was this, Mr. President? Because I thought it was right. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Please continue. Please continue. Uh, then, uh, in your opinion, there's been no great change in campaigning because of the advent of gadgets like television and radio, et cetera. Well, Mr. President, then in your opinion, the advent of these gadgets like radio and television have not changed the basic problem of campaigning, is that right? I think that's exactly right. I don't think it's changed the basis of campaigning at all. A good campaigner is a man who knows how to convince people that what he believes in is right, and who knows how to make that stick and make, make people understand it. And it takes personal contact to do that. You can do it face to face better than uh, from a distance. I always could. Suddenly he broke off the conversation and he said, Merle, are you familiar with the case of Mr. Smythe? And I was thinking through it and I said, no, sir, I'm afraid I'm not. And I was worried because you take your head off if you're a reporter and haven't done your homework. That's right. And I said, no, sir, I'm afraid I'm not. And he said, Mr. Smythe is a female who was permitted by the BBC to broadcast, doubting the existence of God. And the old man said, I, I was deeply perturbed. And, and I caused to be summoned the appropriate officials of the BBC, and because I was then still prime minister. <laughs> and I expressed to them my perturbation, and I suggested that uh, doubt should not be spread where no doubt existed uh, uh, heretofore. And they said to me, ah, yes, uh, but we gave equal time to the other side. To which I replied by saying, ah, yes, and I have no doubt that had you commanded this miraculous medium at an earlier period in history, in your even-handed justice and refusal to make decisions, uh, you would indubitably have given equal time to Jesus and to Judas Iscariot. <laughs> oh, that's a This point. is the final comment on the equal time theory. Yes, it's, as far as perfect. it's perfect. It's no. just perfect. I wanted to get that on the phone for a long time. Thank you. Okay, let's get back to work here. You have a feeling uh, that uh, the dollars divided between the three services mm -hmm. is done by us. Yeah. Mr. President, do you have the feeling that the primary need may be in the various areas? My opinion that the dollars to the various services has been obtained by those who have the best pull of the Congress. Uh, the idea of a unification of the services, you had that idea when you were still in the Senate. Mm. Mr. President, you brought about the unification of the armed services. That's correct. Did you have that idea when you were in the Senate? Yes, indeed. Uh, that chairmanship of that committee to investigate the National Defense Program gave me that idea, and I had it before that even, but I was, I was convinced by that investigation. What hurt you most about the presidency? Um, and once earthed, you stayed earthed. <laughs> well, it's nothing in that. <laughs> but what earthed you most about the presidency? Well, I'm not easy to earth. The thing that earthed me most was when I jumped on my family. Uh, do you see any possibility in the future of lightening this terrible load yeah. on the president? Do you see any possibility in the future of lightening this terrible load that the president carries in terms of ceremonial functions and the signing of documents and so forth? Well, every effort has been made to lighten that burden, but I don't think there's any way in the world to take the responsibility away from the president without changing the form of government. Uh, historically, most progress has been made when the president was willing to join battle with the Congress. Mm -hmm.
It is true, isn't it, Mr. Price? That's true. Which fight did you enjoy the most? Which fight did you enjoy the most? That's hard to answer because in politics, the fight's what makes the thing interesting, and there were plenty of them in my administration. Uh, what limitations on the right to report should be placed on journalists, and then after that, the one including... What limitations should be placed upon the right of reporters to report? I don't think there should be any limitation if the reporters are, are men of honesty and judgment. They're perfectly willing to help in that line. Do you feel that in the case of reporting on Red China that no artificial bars should be established? That's true. Uh, if I was willing to wish to get naked, I'd be allowed to do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the British said. <laughs> Is it unavoidable to have a certain amount of graft in government? Mr. President, in a government that is as big as ours, is a certain amount of graft unavoidable? I think it can be avoided. I hate grafters, and I think they can be stopped. And there's very little in the governments of the United States, I can assure you of that. Uh, I'm told that at one point, Mr. President, you went to see General Marshall when you were senator and told him that senator. Huh. President, you were an artilleryman in World War I. That's right. I am told that at one point... Correct, and he wouldn't let me. Did you ever regret not being able to get back in the artillery? Did you ever regret not being able to go back with the artillery again? Oh, yes. I always regretted it because I would still be in the Senate if that had happened. Uh, in 1944, did you think you would remain in the Senate? Before the 1944 convention, had you prepared any speech and nomination and then? Um, had you uh, you never heard of, you never heard from President Roosevelt yeah. directly in the nomination. You never heard directly from President Roosevelt that you were his choice. Not until the day before the last president was to be uh, nominated. Then with President Roosevelt, that was another example of making people do mistakes. Then with President Roosevelt, that was another example of a politician's ability to make people do what they didn't want to do. That's correct. That's correct. But a uh, person who's uh, in the government in the same party with the president will never find it possible to thwart him. You have to help him. Brian George? Yes. Uh, well, would it not be possible that some of the problems with Governor Burns came from the 19th? 44 nominations in mm. Would it not be possible, Mr. President, that some of your difficulties with Mr. Burns subsequently arose from the fact that he felt that he should have been there in the White House where you were? That might be the case. I'm not in a position to say. <coughs> Back to one camera. Uh, what do you miss most about not being in the White House? What do you miss most about not being in the White House? The little I miss by not being in the White House. The only thing I really miss is information. In 1952, the campaign was Korea, Corruption, and Communism. What do you think about Communism in government? What did you think? In 1950... Communism the government to raise the price that the problem is good over it, and they found out that is true. Uh, you think, did you refer to the Alger Hiss case as a red herring? Did you refer to the Alger Hiss case as um, a red herring? No, a reporter did that. Did you expect such a clamor? Did you expect such a clamor to arise as a result of the removal of General MacArthur? Yes, I expected it, and I was ready to meet it. I'm skipping yeah. uh, What was the most difficult? Where do we get that car out of the way? What was the most difficult speech you ever had to make? Mm. Speech or decision? Speech. Oh, yeah. Question I ever tried to make, which was never made. 
Do you remember what you said immediately after hearing the president of Roosevelt's death? Do you remember what you said immediately after hearing of President Roosevelt's death? Mrs. Roosevelt informed me, and uh, I asked her if there was anything I could do for her. And she said there was nothing I could do for her, that I was the one who was in trouble, and they'd try to help me. Uh, what was the basic difference between you and John L. Lewis? What was Mr. President, tell us a little about your relationship with John L. Lewis. He was always very pleasant until he tried to run the government, and then I showed him he couldn't. Is there anything that hurts you that you now regret? No. Mr. Well, President, Mr. President, was there anything that you did while hurt that you now regret? The only thing that I did while I was uh, really angry was when I wrote a letter to a music critic. Mr. President, in your view, what are the qualifications for a successful president? Well, we must, in the first place, uh, be familiar with the political setup that is necessary for a man in politics to know. He's got to be honest, honorable, upright, and carry out his agreements, and he must be strong enough to stand by what he believes as long as he thinks it's right. Sum it up and thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for sitting here for four days on the Florida Keys and answering questions. Well, it's been a very great pleasure to me, and it's also been an education to me, I'll say to you. It certainly has for me. Thank you so very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's do an opening. Uh, Is that Marty? I ran out. Yeah. yeah. Let's do an opening at... Uh, and throw the camera. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Dad. Okay, I'd hump over, she'd walk up and hit me in the back and say, straighten up. Mm -hmm. I'd be an old man. 